a location data firm. Uh, we deal with everything that's got to do with data and analytics and visualization of data that is location based. So any data that has location component to it, uh, we work with the data. So here's a basic agenda for what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about what is GIS, the fundamentals of it. Then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, projections and coordinate systems, uh, talk about different kinds of data. So the first two parts will be me blabbering on for about 15, 20 minutes. So don't get bored, sorry about that. But after that, once we get into the data types, the geoprocessing, we start getting our hand dirty and start working with the data and start playing with it. Then I'm going to talk about just basic cartographic skills of how do you, once you make your results, how do you present it, uh, how do you interpret maps, um, and then I'll talk about raster and image analysis, and then linking it back to the vector data, and then we'll do some practice labs and some questions. That should be good. Uh, okay, just to begin with, how many of you have heard of GIS? One, two, three, four, no? Uh, how much, have you guys used GIS much at all, or have you guys heard about it or what it is? Any idea? No? Okay. So just to start on a light note, I have a small five minute video uh, that talks about, sorry, uh, that talks about how GIS started. So GIS is Geographic Information Systems that started back in 1963 in Canada, and it was mainly developed to manage Canada's natural resources. That's how the idea came about. They have all these forests and farmlands and all of these natural resources that they want to manage. And uh, I have a small video here, which is my, one of my favorite videos, and I'll try to show it in all my presentations, so hopefully you'll enjoy it. To make decisions, we need facts. But we have facts. We have all seen soil maps and census figures. So what's the problem? The problem is not making the surveys. It is trying to read and summarize the results of the surveys. The amount of work involved in handling this data is enormous. Even the simplest operations take hundreds of people. Raw data and statistics have to be catalogued, stored, summarized before the data can be used to make decisions. The process is painfully slow. It's bad enough when you're handling census data. It's even worse when you have to handle maps. And so much of our land information comes only in maps. Suppose an administrator wants to find out how much good farming land in his province is still undeveloped and where. He has to compare the maps showing good farming areas with the ones showing present land use. But they are not at the same scale. First, one map must be remade as a transparent overlay at the exact scale of the other map. Checked, retouched, positioned. To measure the area where both factors overlap, he will probably use a dot grid, a method that hasn't changed since the days of ancient Egypt. What if he wants to consider other factors, such as the incomes of the people, crop yields in a certain soil, forestry, wildlife, recreation, climate, census data? To compare two factors over 100 square miles will take one man a whole working day. To compare only six basic factors for all of Canada would take 556 people eight hours a day for three years. It would cost eight million dollars. But we don't have the staff, we don't have the time. More resource data comes in every year, every month, every day. Crop and forest assessment, soil surveys, forestry surveys, timber pest counts, wildlife surveys, sampling, analysis, and many others. Right, so that kind of sums up of why GI started, right? We have all this massive data that's coming in, 
And that was back in 1963. Okay, the problem is the same right now. Only thing is technology has improved. Now we have Twitter, Facebook, all this IoT, sensors everywhere. And data is coming in not every day, they're coming in every minute, every second now. So the problem is the same. How do we manage, analyze, and visualize these massive amounts of data? So what is GIS? Right? A GIS is a system designed to capture, store, manipulate, analyze, manage, and present spatial information. So just like any other data, the only thing what makes GIS data special is that it's got that geographic component to it. It's got the location information. Right? Most of your uh, databases come textual. They're all pretty much text, numbers, or any kind of uh, just attribute information, you don't have any geometries, you don't have any location information. So what makes GIS special is that it can, it's, it's able to handle uh, geographic data sets and being able to analyze those data sets pretty fast, okay? Just like any other information system, GIS also requires people, right, to do the work. Data, without data, GIS doesn't work. Uh, analysis is the results that come out of it and then the hardware and the software. So that goes, that's the same for any information systems, right? You need people, data, hardware, software, and analysis. Um, so GIS is pretty much a mathematical construct for representing ge uh, geographic objects um, or surfaces as data. So GIS data comes in two formats, vector and raster. So vector data is anything that you can consider as discrete, right? That is not continuous, for example, a location of a bike rack, a location of a bank, or a coffee shop. These are discrete locations on Earth. They are not, they are not like a continuous surface, so they can be represented in vector. Raster data sets are cell matrices or images. For example, weather data. Every single centimeter, every single meter on the Earth has a value for weather, right? So if you are standing here, as opposed to I'm standing over there. Yeah, it might be the same temperature, but there are still two separate values. It could be different, it could be the same. So whenever you have continuous data, you use something called a raster data model. And when you have discrete locations on Earth, you would use something called a uh, vector data model. And in GIS, uh, the way we do analysis is we overlay these sets of data because they are all referenced to the same point on Earth. So if I have one point for the coffee shop, and then I have a surface, a raster showing the temperature around the coffee shop, I can overlay them, and if I have hundreds of coffee shops, I can overlay all those hundreds of coffee shops over that weather data and say what is the weather in each of those coffee or coffee shops. Does that, does that make sense? So in a more graphic way, this is how it works, right? So we have our data, whatever data you're collecting in the field, and then you have other sets of administrative data or any other data that's available out there that you can bring in to support your analysis. And you overlay them or you stack them on top of each other to overlay and analyze to see what is going on. So the, one, of, one of the main problems with GIS is our Earth is spherical, right? And whenever you've seen a map, you've seen it on a flat screen or on a paper that's been printed. And the, the issue there is it's really hard to transform something that's spherical onto a flat plane. There's always going to be an error. There's always going to be some distortion in your data, right? So what we do to address that is we use something called projections and reference systems, right? What projections are is it takes your spherical Earth and displays it or, or uh, transforms it into a planar field so you can actually make sense out of it. So that's why when you see uh, globes as opposed to maps, you look at Antarctica, you look at Arctic, uh, on a globe, it looks a very small area in the bottom of the globe or on the top of the globe, but when you expand that onto a paper map, Antarctica pretty much covers the entire southern part of the, the world, and Arctic covers the entire northern part of the world. And the reason for that is there's distortion, right? And you look at Greenland, and you compare it to the United States or to Australia, it looks like the same size, because when you're further up north, there's more distortion. We'll talk about that a bit more. So the best model for the Earth would be a globe. Obviously, it's the best way to uh, represent our Earth, but it's really hard to work with mathematically because it's very complicated and it's very resource intensive, right? And uh, the other thing is when you're in spherical, uh, kind of, okay, so back up. So globes are large and they're cumbersome. They're generally of a scale, unsuitable for the purpose that we're trying to do analysis in. So usually if you've seen a globe, you've seen a globe of the whole world. But if you want to do analysis just in Christchurch, for example, how would you do that in a globe? Right, you can't fit Christchurch in a spherical model because at that scale, 
it's pretty flat. There's not that much of a curvature, right? So to, to deal with these things, we use projections and coordinate systems. Standard measurements like uh, rulers, protractors, planimeters, grids don't work on, on globes. And the reason being, uh, the reason being is all of our longitudes that go north-south converge at the poles, right? So at the pole, that is the, the distance between the two longitudes changes as you go north and south, right? Can you see that? Whereas latitudes that go east-west are parallel, they'll never meet, right? Longitudes meet on the poles, so the distances between the longitudes are, it's a, it's a perfect square at the equator, and as you go further north, that distance keeps decreasing, right? And at the pole, it's zero. So how do you address for that? How do you account for that? Uh, that's why we need projections. So a map projection is a set of mathematical models uh, that transform spherical coordinates into plane Earth, into flat surfaces. Uh, they take your lat longs. Latitude longitudes are always in degrees, minutes, and seconds because it's a spherical coordinate system. And they transform them into meters or feet into our flat into Cartesian coordinate systems. And so it's a lot easier to work with. How do you, if I go back to the previous example there, if you want to measure the distance between, let's say, uh, the, Cape, the, the Cape of Africa, so there's South America, sorry, South America to, let's say, Congo or something, or let's say if you want to go from South America to England, if you want to measure the distance, the distance between these are changing between every longitude. So how do you account for that? Right? So you have to know exactly every meter that you're moving up, what is the distance. But if you transform it into a flat Cartesian coordinate, it's very easy to do those measurements. So that's why we use map projections, and they transform those lat longs into uh, planar Cartesian coordinate systems. So here's an example. So what they do is they take the Earth and they put a cone on top of the Earth, right? And then they open the cone, and then now you have planar coordinates. Same thing with cylindrical. So uh, conical coordinate systems or conical projections are really good for areas that are subtropical, right? Above 23 degrees, uh, Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn, above those, the conic projections work really well. If you're on the equator and between the tropics, so the cylindrical projection works really well. And if you're out in the poles, like Antarctica and Arctic, planar projections work really well. And the way that works is imagine if you had the cylinder sitting on top of the earth and then you have a light glowing on it and then you open the paper. Right? That's how you get your flat maps. It's projected. I, I, technically, it's project, your Earth is being projected onto a flat piece of surface and then they're presented to you. And that's what GIS softwares do very well. All these models, all these mathematical models are already developed, all these modules are already implemented into the software, all you have to do is click a few buttons and you get your transformations, right? But what makes your analysis useful or valuable is that you're aware of these things. You should be aware of where you're doing the analysis, which part of the world are you doing, right? So, so that you can use the right kind of projection. Also, when you apply projection to data, what ends up happening is there's always a distortion. Either you're distorting shape, or you're distorting distance, or you're distorting the direction, or the area. You can never preserve all of those things, because like I said, if you're taking something spherical and flattening it out, there's going to be an error, right? So depending upon your analysis, if you're trying to do routing, like for example, if you're trying to do uh, traverse across the Antarctic, and you're trying to analyze that, you want to use something that preserves distance. You don't care about the shape. The shape might look however, but you want to make sure that the distance between the two points are accurate. So you would use something, uh, a projection that's called an equidistant projection that will help you uh, do your analysis for uh, distances and traveling properly. If you're trying to calculate areas, for example, uh, local city councils, they manage all their tax parcels and tax lots and all of your taxes and the rates that you pay are based on the area of your land. And in that case, if you want to map that, then what's important is you want to preserve the area. The direction doesn't matter, the distance doesn't matter, but the area of your features need to be maintained and preserved. So you would use something called an equal area projection. So there are lots of different kinds of projection. Uh, at the end of the class, or even after this, I can email you a set of uh, resources where you can go and read more about these kind of projections and use the ones that you want to use uh, for your for your particular analysis. Uh, during our labs and during our practices, I'll show you how do we change projections, how do we deal with it. Uh, but if you want to learn more about it, I'll send you some links that you can follow up on. Then, 
once we have the idea of what kind of projection we want to use, um, in a globe, your center is where the equator and the prime meridian meets. Right? That's your zero, zero. And all your lat longs are calculated from there. So prime meridian is zero degrees longitude, and the equator is zero degrees latitude. And as you go east of the prime meridian, then your numbers increase, right? 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees. For example, Christchurch is sitting at 43 degrees latitude and then, oh sorry, yeah, 43 degrees latitude and 172, 172 degrees longitude east and 43 degrees south. Whereas if you go to Canada, it's sitting at somewhere around 34 degrees north and for, uh, 100, 110 degrees west. But the problem is, in uh, when you're doing mathematical computations and calculations, it can't understand what east and west means. Right? You, how do you do a math between east and west? You can't do that. So what they do in uh, when they transform it is they convert them into uh, into uh, a Cartesian coordinate. So just to illustrate that, you have your Cartesian coordinate system. Let's say this is your globe, and this is your prime meridian, and that's your equator. This is going to be all the locations here, above the equator and east of the prime meridian, are going to be positive, positive. So all your lat longs will be positive, positive. If you are south of the equator and east of the prime meridian, so this is going to be a latitude, this is going to be a longitude. Uh, south of the equator, your latitudes are going to be uh, still positive. Sorry, south. negative. Yeah. Sorry. And then your longitudes are going to be positive. And then if you come to west of the prime meridian and south of the equator, both of them are negative. And then over here, your latitude is positive or, yeah, and no, sorry, your latitude is negative and your longitude is positive. Okay? Does that make sense? Other way. Other way around. The last quarter. Yeah. Oh, this one, sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, longitudes are negative. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, that's how we can do some mathematics around it. But again, you're still stuck with the problem of this being 34 degrees north, 101 degrees west. You still can't deal with that, right? So what we want to do is we want to convert those into meters, feet, inches that we can actually measure and get some valuable input. That's where we get coordinate systems. So once we have projected our map, once we have selected what, what our analysis is going to be, it's going to be based on um, distance or area or whatever it is, then we have to pick our coordinate systems. So the geographic system, which is latitude and longitude, are based on angles, minutes, and degrees, and they're not valid for measurement on a plane. So therefore, a Cartesian coordinate system is employed to address that. So you end up from a globe to something like this, right? And this is where you see Antarctica looks like it's a massive landmass. It is pretty big, but it's not that big, right? That's because you're trying to project sphere onto a platter. Same thing with the Arctic on top, and as you can see, um, Australia and America look very similar, although, uh, oh sorry, uh, America and Canada look very similar, although Canada is a lot bigger landmass than America is, okay? So, uh, this is something that you want to be aware of or be cognizant about when you're doing your uh, analysis or your studies, because, it plays a very important role. All right. Then going back, so once we understand that we are able to now project our globe onto a flat piece of paper or a screen, uh, we go into data types. Like any information systems, GIS is nothing without data. Right? Uh, you can have, you can build awesome models, you can build amazing stuff, but if you don't have good data and if you don't know how to uh, collect or visualize data, then the whole system falls apart. So spatial data is often referred to as layers. And, the, and what makes spatial data unique is that it's often rooted in spatially explicit in nature. So the data itself is useless if it's not in a particular location. Okay, so starting off, vector data. Vector data provide a way to represent real world features within the environment. Uh, a feature is anything you can see in the landscape. So think about you're standing on top of a hill, and you can see rivers, mountains, houses. All of those can be represented as features on a map, right? Uh, vector features have attributes. So the other thing that makes GIS powerful is not only do you have the geometry, you also have the associated attributes with them. So just like uh, how many of you are aware of SQL tables and 
databases, or just an Excel spreadsheet for that matter, right? So if you're an Excel spreadsheet, you have a lot of uh, textual attributes, which is important because that's what you do your graphs in and charts in, that's how you analyze the data. But you also have in GIS the geometry associated with it. So anything on our world can be, like I said, can be represented as vector or raster, and then vector can be further broken down into three categories, points, lines, and polygons. So anything that is discrete on our planet can be represented as a point, line or polygon. So here's an example of point features, right? Point represent a location on the ground. Either they are true points, or uh, benchmarks, or section corners, or virtual points. So for example, these are cities. So if you look at a global map, right, you will see cities marked as points because you're looking at a very zoomed out scale. Then we have lines. These are your roads, rivers, Pipelines, utilities, they're all represented as lines on a map. Okay, cables, uh, and so for, for a line, you need to have a pair of points. So if you have two points, you can form a line with those two points, and that forms your line feature. Then the third one is a polygon. And polygons are bounded areas. That means three or more sets of coordinates. So if you have, uh, so a point requires one pair, just one latitude, one longitude, that will give you a point on the earth, then for a line you need uh, two pairs minimum to get a straight line between two points, so that will be your x2, y2, and then for a polygon you need a third point that will give you a polygon, right? So you need three sets of coordinates to make a polygon, two sets for a line minimum, and one for a point. And uh, what's important here is the scale, right? For example, in a world map, cities can be represented as points. But the minute you zoom in to, let's say, Canterbury level, now Christchurch, instead of being a point, can now be represented as a polygon, because now it's an area, right? Then you can start looking at points within Christchurch. But at a global scale, showing Christchurch as a polygon is meaningless, because it doesn't, A, you can't see it, because you're way far zoomed out, and B, it doesn't add any value to your analysis, right? So depending upon the scale, your features can change the type of feature it is. And we'll do some, uh, uh, we'll do some playing around with that in a bit. So that is kind of the basics of what GIS is. So you have uh, information systems. Uh, it helps you uh, project your spherical world into a flat piece of paper. And on top of that, you can represent features in vector uh, and raster. And first we'll talk about vectors, and after we do some exercises in vector, we move on to the last part of things. So without further ado, let's get some data and start exploring. So hopefully all of you have QGIS installed on your machines. Is that right? Yes? No? No? OK. So to download QGIS, just Google QGIS and download it. And what we're going to do is we're going to download a few data sets. Uh, obviously, I was, I was planning to do some exercises in Antarctica, but unfortunately, A, the data is really hard to find. Uh, B, it's really hard to explain things in the sense of Antarctica because all you can see is a big ice shelf. And uh, to understand what's actually going on, I thought it might be easy if we, if we start with this bigger geography, and then we can think about how we can apply these ideas um, to our projects. So what we're going to do today is we're going to download some, some places, some city names. Then we're going to download some rivers, both lines and polygons. And you can see what I mean by the scale dependent, depending on what scale you are. And then we're going to download some land districts, which are our regions. And then we can, we're going to do some analysis around that. Oh, and also we're going to download some population data from stats, this is the stats web page. So whenever you guys are ready downloading QGIS, let me know. And while you're downloading QGIS, you can also go ahead and download these data sets uh, from those URLs there. Do we download that to a browser? Uh, these ones? The yeah, QGIS. The, the data lens. That yeah, so you just go to your browser, and then you can, uh, once, you come, once you go to this URL, I can just actually go through it with you. So I'm going to go to data. Okay. So 
Uh, most news and organizations like Lens, uh, Landcare Research, all of these guys have, are really good resources for getting GIS data. Um, at, the end of the, at the end of the session, I'll have a little PowerPoint showing all of the available resources within New Zealand that you can go to get data and globally to get some uh, world data as well. But uh, start off and study uh, New Zealand here. So once you're here, let's look for what was the first one. And the first one was uh, places. Yeah, so let's just search for places. Go ahead and download this land online electorate place deprecated. Let's go ahead and download that. They call it deprecated because they've updated their places data set, they just haven't updated it here yet. So let's just go ahead and download that. So to download that, you just click on the three dots and then click download. search for places. Yeah. And then it's going to be that one there. So you just go down. Or oh, you can press add. So you can press the little plus button and it will add it to your map and you can kind of explore the data and see what's going on. So when you do the... What's the difference between that and the download? So the plus just adds it to the map here. And so you can just explore the data. You can just look at it. Uh, you can't bring it into your QGIS yet. So if you want to bring it into your software, you download it. It's just like uh, uh, looking at an Excel sheet on your Google Docs as opposed to downloading it and working on your own Excel file. That's, that's the only difference. Um, and then you can click around on the points and see kind of what attributes are available along those points. So that's what I mean. So in GIS, every geometry, so every point, lines, and polygon have associated attribute table with them, right? So what that allows you is not only can you look at the points spread out spatially where they are located in space, but you can also look at some additional attributes with it, right? Does that make sense? So in, in this data set, all they've given is the name of that particular suburb and they've given the location as in Kaisha City. But imagine you can pretty much have any number of attributes here. You can have population, you can have uh, weather data, you can have anything that you want associated with that neighborhood, right? Or any other point. For example, these points could be wells. And with wells, you can have the, the, the year the well was drilled, uh, the depth of the well, and uh, how many times the well been measured. Uh, you can have the measurement of the well for every year. And then based on that, you can do analysis using uh, the desktop software to see how the water level in that well has been changing over time. Okay, so just giving an example there. So, has, any, has everybody been able to download? Okay. Yeah? Uh, you need to sign up? Uh, most likely, yep. Oh, of course, I've explained that. Yep, I'm signed in, but you might have to create a free account for Linz, it's free. So, you might have to sign up into an account. We just choose um, uh, NZG 2000 check file as the format? Yes, for now, yep. So, when you, when you hit Download. If I go here and I click download, um, I'm going to have map projections here, right? So this is what I was talking about. When you download the data, you want to make sure that you pick the right coordinate in the projection system, right? So New Zealand, we are lucky. Um, we are we are we are another small country. Uh, we cannot fit between. We don't have a lot of time zones, so we cannot fit between a particular set of longitudes. So uh, New Zealand has come up with something called the NZGD 2000, is that NZT in there? GD. There should be a 2193. So yeah, so that one there is the official coordinate system 
that New Zealand is converting to and Linz is trying to push a standard 